We're riding on the internet, cyberspace set free. Hello, virtual reality. Interactive appetite, searching for a website, a window to the world, got to get online. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set, you're going surfing on the internet. It's the year 1993. It's pre-9-11, pre-Iraq, pre-2008 crash, post the end of the Soviet Union, pre-dot-com bubble burst, pre-Fox News, and now this incredible new technology. Have you heard of it? It's called the internet. Is spreading rapidly into homes. So where else can we go? Want to write a letter to President Clinton? Would he answer us? I bet he would. Let's tell them how much we love the internet. You can look up almost any fact instantly. You can communicate instantly. Anyone can become informed about anything instantly. Workers, ordinary people, neighbors, dissidents under dictators can organize, share, discuss simply, quickly, and easily. Book after book, scholar after scholar, and article after article celebrate the techno-utopian potential of this new democratic technology. Fast forward 25 years and comedian and YouTuber Ethan Klein has started a trending Twitter spat storm by tweeting that podcaster and comedian and all-round MMA person, fighter, and most likely one of the most influential people on the planet, Joe Rogan, who, quote, lives on elk meat, egg yolk, and human growth hormone with lungs full of tar, thinks he's healthier than everyone. This m is such a b that when he got COVID, he threw the kitchen sink at it. If you're so healthy, just ride it out like you say a man should. He then posts a follow-up. You say I'm unhealthy, yet Joe Rogan, adjusted for outfit, has the same body as me. Interesting. Media companies like The Independent, The Washington Examiner, NBC, and commentators like Vouch and Tim Pool all discuss the tweet. But what we should be talking about is uh, Joe Rogan experiencing, you know, the truth for the first time. I That was a bad segue. Uh, Joe Rogan has actually had doctors and researchers, scientists on his show to talk about this issue. The greatest... Twitter beef in all of human history. No exaggeration. Good place, okay? He says lungs full of tar. Is is Joe Rogan a smoker? I didn't... I mean, yeah, yeah. Weed, right? I don't know. You don't know really, you're not be, supposed to inhale Yeah, obviously, cigars. so how would your lungs be filled with tar? Then? Joe Rogan hasn't even responded. Will he? What will he say? The drama. NBC have already called it a dispute between Rogan and Klein, but most importantly between Rogan, who's been embraced by conservative figures, and Klein, whose fan base is largely progressive. It's a battle of ideas. It's Vidal versus Buckley, Burke versus Payne, Freud versus Young, all over again. I wonder if we asked a 90s techno optimist for an example of what a political discussion might look like on the internet 20 years from then, they'd predict something like this. Anyway, I want to try and use this very trivial moment to try and answer a very important question. Why hasn't the internet fixed democracy? Alternative title, being triggered by cats. What well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet that, anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one? What do you write to it like mail? Okay, to dive in, we should begin by asking hypothetically and tentatively, what would have to be the case for the internet to have fixed democracy? The first thing that's been pointed to by followers of the philosopher Jürgen Habermas is that the public sphere, where our political discussion, debate and agenda setting is happening, would have to be a rational place. A place where we can come to mutual agreement about what the best thing to do is on any given topic. Rationality is, ironically, an ambiguous concept, but Habermas pointed to several features of rational decision-making in the public realm. He said that discussion is about verifying certain claims. People need to be reflexive about their beliefs. 
people need to be able to put themselves in others' positions so as to be impartial. People need to be sincere. They need to mean what they say. Each participant should have equal say, and their voices have equal weight. The discussion should be autonomous from state and corporate power. This list isn't exhaustive, but I think it's a good start. Now, let's look at what Klein is saying about Rogan. First, he's saying that Rogan is a hypocrite. He's also claiming he was more afraid of COVID than he suggested. The wider implication is about Rogan's claim that no one is talking about fitness as a preventative measure, which itself is a claim about the focus on and efficacy of vaccines and lockdowns. There are a few other direct implications thrown in. Responsibility, fat shaming, fitness in general. But we could also look at some of the wider discussion too like this from Tim Pool and Co. According to this philosopher King, for example, it's about socio-sexual hierarchy, gammas and alphas. Like a so if you understand, if you understand um, uh, socio-sexual hierarchy, right, this is typical gamma male rage against an alpha male, right? Mm. This is the basic idea of, you know, someone who's kind of at the bottom of the food chain in, in terms of preference, uh, lashing out at someone who is higher up on the food chain from them. And it's it's very simple. You see this a lot um, with YouTubers, but not just YouTubers in general. That's just they're more ubiquitous these days. Um, you, you see it everywhere. You see it in life. You see it in, you know, office hierarchy. You see it in high schools, colleges. I mean, just say resentment if I guess that's what you're saying. I feel like if you have to say something like this, you must think you're an alpha, but be deeply insecure about it. Anyway, this is beside the point I'm trying to make. There are a lot of claims going on in this one very dumb moment. Let's look at what they say about the thesis we're exploring here, why the internet hasn't saved democracy. We'll look at the clash of incommensurable values, a bit of Wittgenstein, some agenda setting, some Sartre, some personality ideas, the idea of being triggered, emotion, and of course, cats. And finally, we'll return to that question. Could the internet save democracy? Okay, first, we have a clear clash of what philosophers have called incommensurable values. That's two positions that are irreconcilable. Liberty and equality, say. These are two frequently used examples, and someone might argue that you can't have one at the same time as the other. But more importantly, often it's impossible to rationally calculate which value is most important to pursue because there's no common measure, no universal yardstick for working out which one is more rational, which one is better. How do you decide between a career as a lawyer and one as an artist? Do the pros and cons tally along the same axis? How can you compare preferences for money or creativity, say? A claim related to Klein's point might be that getting fit is not a reasonable response to a pandemic. And a Rogan claim might look something like personal responsibility is more important than restricting liberty. Now, you could use data to back up either of these claims. You could argue about the history of liberty as a philosophical concept and its importance, or the benefits of a healthy diet for fighting disease. But ultimately, these claims could be incommensurable, at least for some people, some of the time. Now, I could make the argument that while of course being healthy is important to fight COVID, there's a limit to its efficacy because one, it's difficult to get healthy, two, it's a difficult time to do it in, three, there's not enough time to do it in, in a pandemic, and four, the people dying or becoming sicker with COVID are often older or poorer, so are more likely to be unhealthy for reasons they can't control. There are many rational points to be made here. However, there's no absolute proof that's going to convince someone that holds 
absolute libertarian freedom as their highest value no matter what. Again, there's no standard measure, no ruler that we can use to discover which one of these claims trumps the other. A similar concept is the moral dilemma, the trolley problem, or the existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre used the example about a young man's choice between going to England to join the free French forces or staying in France to take care of his aging mother. Which choice is better? Is better even the appropriate term? Whichever the young man chooses, he's lost something that he wants to do. And before we even get to a discussion or a choice about something, we've assigned importance to the values and beliefs we hold that weight them differently. That might be diet or lockdowns or vaccines or equality or liberty, whatever it is. The conceptual ranking we have affects the weight we place on the corresponding data the studies or the arguments that we choose to utilize or that just appear to us. But okay, we know all this, but I think it does point to another phenomenon, a wider phenomenon, the order of things. If we tried to turn this into a rational, verifiable political discussion, turn it into an academic paper, say, it might look something like this. The efficacy of encouraging improvements to health as public policy during a pandemic? But is it just about efficacy? I really like the word efficacy today, apparently. Is it just about the validity of a statement? It's surely also about people's lifestyles, what they're doing, what they're experiencing, what they're valuing in the moment. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein pointed to this problem in his famous idea of language games. He argued that language cannot be understood scientifically because language is not just descriptive. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the world and how we speak or write that's verifiable. Tree meaning tree. He used the example of water. We cannot rationally and verifiably decide what water means at all times and set it down in a dictionary because the meaning of anything is inseparable from our daily lived experience of using the word. The word means something different depending on the context, whether it's describing the ocean or a drink, whether it's a label on a bottle or a demand, an order. The answer to what would you like to drink, sir? In answering water, a person is not just describing the fluid, but is also making a request for something, or a demand, or an order. And that means different things depending on whether it's a sick man begging for a drink, a child asking their mother for a drink, or a king demanding something of an aid. Later philosophers like J.L. Austin pointed out that some language does things, like I do at a wedding. I promise to a friend, or I name this ship, the performats that change what we're doing in the world. So, and this is very clear on Twitter, by the way, Conversa Twitter, by the way, at Lulu Waller. Conversation is not about verifying some fact or data point. It's about the flow of things. It's about the conversation itself and language games create options for responses, kind of metaphysical rules about what might or could or should be said next, a kind of likeliness for something coming to mind after you've said a certain thing, when the conversation is moving in a certain direction. Imagine two classical Marxists having a discussion about elections. There's an outline, a pathway that you could predict the conversation is likely to go down. But, and here's the big but, the development of a conversation depends, of course, on the values of those interlocutors. The different values of each person dictate where the conversation goes next. The question becomes, not what does the evidence say, but what's the likely next move going to be in the game? 
And the likely move for someone like Rogan might be towards fitness more. What's the more likely move for a scientist, say, working on the vaccine? The moves we make are wonderfully and beautifully diverse, and a platform like Twitter has thrown them all together, making the direction of conversations unpredictable and often chaotic in a way that wouldn't happen in the newsroom of the Washington Post, say, where it would be more predictable. Take any disagreement on Twitter. Person A holds a position on a topic, makes a claim. Person B points out that fact X supporting that position is false. Person A responds that person B has missed the point. They weren't talking about that property of fact X. Person C comes in and says that's not the relevant data anyway. So it's not about plucking from some objective pile of static data. There are an infinity of values backing up values and claims backing up claims, and each one demands different counterpoints, different deconstructions, different types of evidence. The list for this goes on and on, and it spider webs out in different directions depending on the person. All of these moves set an agenda which used to be set by elites, by newspaper editors, by television studios. In the offices of old legacy media, there was a much tighter control over how the agenda was set, over how long to address a certain issue, over how important it was and how it related to other stories, over what the priorities were. This has now been democratised to an extent, but is much more subject to the whims of all our different approaches to different issues. We're a very varied species. But the moves we make online aren't quite as free as they appear. An early techno-utopian, John Perry Barlow, wrote in his Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace in 1996 that Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. But it turned out that cyberspace was not some otherly realm independent of the pre-existing power and material conditions of the real world. It turns out the same people had power. The offline power blocks have sovereignty over the places servers are held, where the data's held, over the citizens that log on, over who has contacts with who. The EU and US governments can enforce cookie policy. Corporations have massive advertising budgets. Special interests still have the same power online. This offline stuff translates over into the online world. And, as it turns out, we all like to gather in a handful of places online, rather than lots of interconnecting forums and chat rooms and blogs, so the tech giants have lots of power over those places. Clay Shirky, another early techno-optimist, has said that one thing he underestimated was the social graph how connections on social media mapped onto offline friends, friends of friends or contacts, onto business and organisational networks, onto NGOs and governments and media and groups. In other words, the structure of the offline world is largely replicated online. Look at how YouTube prioritises videos from the late night shows, for example. Right. Here's a question that I think holds the key to the meaning of life. If we can work this out, we can solve everything. We can achieve world peace and we can build a utopia here on Earth. Why cats? Grumpy Cat, good morning. Are you happy to be do doing this interview with the Today Show in Australia? What is it about the internet and cats? Internet cats even have their own Wikipedia page. You might say they're just cute, they're nice to look at. We have a universal urge to care for something. But then why did we not have cat pages in newspapers before the internet? 
Why weren't there cats on page three of The Sun instead of topless women? Why wasn't everyone reading the weekly cat magazine and carrying around photos of their cats in their wallets to show people? Of course, we all have emotional triggers. The rationalist philosopher Spinoza called them affects, but they're things that we've been evolutionarily coded with to trigger a brain state change to say, ah, this is important, or this is great, to put yourself in a mood to push you away from something or pull you towards it. And they're largely out of our control. Cuteness is of course one. We like to care for fragile things, but as Facebook found in a study, anger is the most evolutionarily powerful. Anger is more likely to grab our attention because we've registered something as dangerous, an attack. We need to ramp up our blood, get more oxygen going, be ready to counterattack. We're more likely to stop scrolling and pay attention to an angry post. Spinoza's list included things like desire, wonder, love, aversion, mockery, fear, pity, envy and lust. He said, they wash over you. They change the state you're in. They draw you into thinking in a particular way of going in a particular direction and of seeing the world through a particular lens. They're trigger points. And as the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio has shown, emotions are a part of how we make rational decisions. He's argued, based on case studies and neuroscientific research, that we don't feel angry, for example, and then pre-select objectively from our knowledge about what to do in that angry state. Feeling angry pre-selects relevant information from our memories for us involuntarily and gives it to the conscious part of the brain to do the final part of the decision making. The classic example is the bear attack. When you encounter a bear, you're not scared then think through all the things that you know about surviving a bear attack. Being scared is part of the data selection process. It triggers parts of the brains that are relevant and pre-selects the time that you read about not running and the other time that you saw a bear attack on YouTube. We don't flick through our memories like filing cabinets. We're set off emotionally by encounters. But the wider point here is that using the internet has meant more trigger points, more emotional encounters. On the internet, we're thrown together in such a way that we're constantly exposed to these triggers. We're like children thrown together into the playground for the first time and left to our own devices without any norms to follow. The internet has, quite clearly, made us more emotionally charged. Walking down the street 20 years ago, there wasn't much chance of getting triggered over Bernie Sanders mittens or because someone shouts let's go Brandon at you. Weight, health, image, hypocrisy, they're all great emotional triggers. They guide our decision making progress. Now you might be thinking, so what? Isn't all of this just obvious? Of course we have values that clash. Of course what we talk about depends on our daily lives. Of course the internet has changed how the agenda is set. And of course we're emotional as well as rational creatures. But the important point to make is this. What's become central is not what's being said, but how, in what context, with what emphasis, with whose backing it's said. And that has consequences for how we should design our social platforms. The political conversation is not about rational fact selection from an objective body of knowledge. The political conversation is about process, about who gets to say what and when, and what and when algorithms amplify or quieten something. This escaped the early techno-utopians. They forgot that knowledge is not just about static objects and facts, but about people, in motion, 
It's about process. Watch this, it fascinates me. The Timcast crew have been moved into this language games position where it's reasonable for them to talk about how good Joe Rogan looks as supporting evidence for a particular political view that they hold. Oh. Joe is, uh, he's a healthy guy. Yeah, he is. That's just, I he mean, he is great. fit. I saw an uh, uh, Instagram video of him doing a front kick a couple yeah, days ago. Yeah, he looks yeah. like he was 42 years yeah. old. Yeah, he looks he's, great. He, he exercises all the time. Klein was making a comment about Rogan's character, his trustworthiness, whether he should be listened to. And character is important because it determines the language games, the values, the agenda, and the emotional resonance that's going to direct the route of conversation. But it also means that we get drawn towards, guess what? The drama. Of course, these platforms are going to reward drama, clickbait, anger, and conflict because they're the traits our species have evolved to focus on. But our institutions, our rules, our cultures, and norms are meant to be designed to help us engineer better societies, better ways of living, help us come together in new ways. Take just one example, the institution of due process or the idea of trial by jury. These are institutions and norms that are meant to balance the impulse of anger, of retribution and revenge, and they've done a good job at that. We have lots of institutional norms that do things like this. Some trivial, like taking your shoes off at a friend's house or bringing a bottle of wine to dinner, saying please and thank you etiquette, and some political or social, like having a certified qualification to prove you're good at something, or libel law to protect against malicious lying. The list here is endless, but the point is that I think we need to approach algorithms in the same way, a way that brings the best out of the process of online political conversation, not the worst so that we're focusing on the things that matter, not on the things that don't. In their book, Ethical Algorithms, for example, Aaron Roth and Michael Kearns talk about some key domains that we should focus on, like privacy, fairness, accountability, and morality. So it's about a procedural process. It's about selecting things. And that's exactly what the algorithms do they select things based on procedural norms. And we want to try and select the trending conversations we're having on importance instead of drama. And I actually think Facebook's decision to use more reactions than just the like response is a good step towards this. They realized that people were drawn towards the topics that other people had responded to angrily. And then they chose to show those posts more to the friends of friends. What if we had an important response, or an empathize, or a pity, a way of more accurately gauging what the triggering response is, and what is more important through the noise? In short, we need to embed in these algorithms ways of determining the drama and determining the important political conversation, so we can shift that conversation more away from those short-term triggers are more towards justice. It's online. I don't know. What do you think, kids? Yeah! Surf's up. See you on the net. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching and as always thank you to all of these people for supporting on Patreon, it's the only way this channel survives and if you'd like to do so through the link below you'll get scripts, you'll get the Discord server, you can have your name in the credits, I tried to provide updates there, so please if you have a dollar or two to spare every month you can do that below. If you don't, like, share, uh, there's a podcast version you can subscribe to, follow me on Twitter at Lulu Waller. All of those things really help, but as always, and most importantly, thank you so much for watching and hopefully see you next time.